we've looked at a lot of things related to linear equations. We now know how to calculate the slope, the difference between the three types of equations of a line, the standard form, the slope-intercept form, and the point-slope form, and we know how to find x and y intercepts algebraically. But we've done all of these things using the variables x and y, and in real-world applications and scenarios, we tend to use other letters. So let's practice with that. I have four equations written with x, n, or t representing the independent variable. For each equation, we're going to identify the slope and the y-intercept. The first equation is v of t equals 10t plus 50. Now we're used to seeing the form y equals mx plus b, and we identify the slope as m. The slope is simply the number in front of that independent variable. In this case, the independent variable is t, so the slope is going to be the number in front of t, or 10. The y-intercept is, is the number that's separate from the variable term. In this case, the plus 50 is the number separate from the t term, and so that's our y-intercept, 0, 50. The next equation is c equals 200 minus 4x. Again, the slope is going to be the number in front of the independent variable, in this case x, so our slope is negative 4, and then our y-intercept is the number that's separate from that, so 200 would be our y-intercept, or we could write that as 0, 200. I'd like you to pause this video and go ahead and try the next two. p of n equals 16n minus 200, and h of t equals 4 minus t. Pause it and come back to me when you're finished. Okay, hopefully you've given that a try. For p of n equals 16n minus 200, the slope is 16, the number in front of n, and the y-intercept is negative 200. So that's 0, comma, negative 200. In h of t equals 4 minus t, the slope is the number in front of t. And in this case, we could rewrite this as 4 minus 1t. So the slope is negative 1 the y-intercept is 4, or 0, 4. Now let's tackle an application problem. It's always a good idea to start by declaring what letters you're going to use to represent the variables, and what each one actually means. We call this declaring the variables. We're going to just declare the variables for each of the scenarios written below. We're not going to solve them or write the models for them. We're just going to practice declaring variables. Here's the first scenario. There are 220 buffalo in one of the herds at Yellowstone National Park. Each year, the number of buffalo in the herd increases by five. What are the two variables in this problem? Well, it looks like one of the variables is the number of buffaloes. We start with 200, and then it's increasing by five. Now, do we have any control over the number of buffaloes? Well, not really. All we can do is measure that number every year. And so it is, in fact, years that represents the other variable in the problem. Let's go ahead and name each of those with a letter. Let's let t be the year, and let's let n be the number of buffaloes. And the function we would write from this would be n of t. In other words, t is the independent variable, and n would be the dependent variable. Okay, the next scenario. When 30 baseball caps are produced, the cost to the company is $250. When 300 baseball caps are produced, the cost to the company is $1,600. Again, we're just going to declare the variables. So it seems that we're counting first the number of baseball caps. We have either 30 or 300 of them. And then we're also looking at the cost to the company. So those should be our two variables. Let's just name them something. Often when we produce a product, we call that variable x or n for the number. Let's just call it x in this case. Let x equal the number of baseball caps produced. It is important here that you say the number of baseball caps produced, because if you just say baseball caps, it could be the price of a baseball cap, it could be the cost of a baseball cap, it could be the number of baseball caps. So it's important that we use the word number here and we use the word produced because we could have some other variable eventually that's the number of baseball caps sold, for example. 
The other variable in this problem is the cost to the company. So let's use a capital C for that. We usually use a capital C for cost. So this is the cost to the company of producing X units. And if we were going to write the function notation for this, it's the cost that's dependent on the number of units produced. So the cost here is the dependent variable and the X is the independent variable. Another thing we often do in real world scenarios is we re-index the time so that zero corresponds to the start of the problem, the start of the scenario or the start of the experiment. Let's go back to that Buffalo scenario and look at it with a specific starting year. Here's the new scenario. There are 220 Buffalo in 2010 in one of the herds at Yellowstone National Park. Each year, the number of buffaloes in the herd increases by five. If I actually graphed this from the year zero, then we would be counting on the horizontal axis by something like 500s. We would have zero, 500, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, and the entire time we're measuring the problem might take place in this tiny little band around the year 2000 with everything else not having data. And so it would be a really sharply increasing line around 2000, no data before that. That turns out to be a bit of an issue because it's not representing the graph in a way that makes any sense. It makes a lot more sense to consider 2010 to be the first year of study of this problem. And then we redefine the variable to be the years since 2010. So if we let t be the year since 2010 and we look at that graph, now we can count along the horizontal axis by 0, 5, 10, 15. And that would cover a span of time from 2010 to 2025. And that makes a lot more sense in the specific context of this problem. If we were to do that, we would see a graph with 220 as our y-intercept increasing with a slope of 5. We often re-index the time in real-world scenarios. And the easiest place to do that is either around your table of data, where you have the year or the month written down, or on the graph, on the actual horizontal axis of the graph. It is really important that you write down what your re-indexing scheme is. For example, in the data below, we're going to re-index the time by defining t as the years since 2010 by just adding a row above the existing data. Here's what the data table says. In the top row, we have year 2010, 2012, 2014, 2016, 2018, counting by every two years. In the second row, we have the population of Buffalo, 220, 230, 240, 250, 260. Remember that the population was increasing by five every year. So that's 10 every two years. To re-index our time, I'm gonna add a row above the years row. T equals years since 2010. So 2010 is gonna be year zero, 2012, year two, 2014, year four, 2016, year six, and 2018, year eight. Now, if I was to graph the data or work with the data in an equation, I would use our new time row 02468 and the population of Buffalo row, the 220, 230, etc. row. I wish I could tell you it was always that easy, but when we look at business data, we are often given the data in quarters or months, and they're not always equally spaced units. We tend to get data from the business world in whatever quarter or month they decide to report it to us. Quarterly data is often reported at the end of a quarter. So when we look at quarter one data, it's actually the data that happens at the end of March. And so that would be 25% of the way through the year. Likewise, if we look at the data that's after quarter four, we're talking about data that was collected up through December 31st, which means that the data is actually reported at the beginning of the next year. So if you have quarter what that means is that if you have data at the end of quarter four, it's actually the next year's data at the very beginning of the year. If you have data by the month, it's typically the end of the month. So January data would be 1 12th of the way or 8.33% of the way through the year. Data from the end of February would be 2 twelfths of the way through the year. And data from the end of December would actually be 12 twelfths of the way through the year or the data that starts the next year. In the data table below, we have data that's counted by year and quarter. 
I want you to redefine the data where t is the years since 2010 and assume that when we say quarter one, that's the end of quarter one. And when we say quarter two, that's the end of quarter two, etc. Pause the video and give this data table a try on your own and then come back to see if you've correctly interpreted it. Okay, let's see how you did. Let me start by reading the data table. So the first row of the table is the year and quarter. The second row of the table is the DAUs in millions. That's daily active users, if you've been following along in these videos. I'll read each column of the table as a pair. So in 2010 quarter two, there were 2.4 million DAUs. In 2012 quarter one, 3.7. In 2013 quarter one, 5.0. In 2013 quarter four, 6.3, and in 2015 quarter two, 7.6. So right away you can see the data is not evenly spaced. We're going to add a row to the table above the first row that says t equals years since 2010. Okay, so 2010 quarter two would be 50% of the way through the year. The beginning of the year would be zero. Halfway through the year would be time 0.5. 2012 at the very beginning would be a year two, but we are at the end of the first quarter. So that would be 2.25, 25% of the way through the year. 2013 would be year three. We're again at the end of quarter one, so that's gonna be 3.25. 2013 quarter four is 100% of the way through 2013, so we're actually not at year three anymore. We're at year four, we're at 4.0, the very beginning of 2014. And finally, 2015 quarter two would be t equals five, but 50% of the way through it. So that would be 5.5. Now, if we were going to construct a function or a graph from this data, we would use the row that redefines t and the row with DAUs in millions.